Welcome to this video, questions and answers about the Perpetual Wealth Code. If you're subscribed to Life Benefits YouTube channel, you may recognize that some of these questions come from the videos there. I've got Dad in the studio with me today to answer some of these questions. Some of them are from his video, The Perpetual Wealth Code, which has been viewed tens of thousands of times on YouTube. Very common, uh, popular video called The Perpetual Wealth Code. He's presenting at one of the Wealth Summits and drawing out how The Perpetual Wealth Code works on screen. The first question that we get on that is you talked about Warren Buffett not paying his taxes in there because he can earn more interest by not paying his taxes than using the money to pay the taxes and not earning the interest on it. He does pay interest to the IRS, though, when that happens. He just expects his differential to be greater than what he's going to pay the IRS. Do you recommend that people don't pay their taxes like that? Absolutely not. Avoiding taxes is legal. Evasion of taxes is illegal. And uh, what we're quoting there is Money Watch uh, did a series on how to think like Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett realizes that money at work is more productive than money that's not at work. And mm -hmm. so if he can make money working for him, make 15 to 20 percent, then he can afford to pay the interest on his taxes, make a profit. And then eventually he's going to pay his taxes because the IRS gets its taxes paid regardless or you go to jail. So we're not a, we're, we're not advocating their tax evasion. We're advocating tax avoidance when it's going to be beneficial to you. Okay. And, and the key words I hear there is when it's going to be beneficial. The average person on the street can't go out and make 20% with the money they would have paid their taxes in most cases. In fact, is that is, what I hear you saying? Exactly. We're not even advocating people not pay their taxes anytime because we're advocating to do what Warren Buffett does with his taxes with a perpetual uh, wealth code with a participating life insurance policy. It makes a whole lot more sense because then you get a benefit from paying that interest instead of just paying interest to the IRS. Very good, yes. The next question I want to ask you is about Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon.com. He talked, he kind of brought up a new term in the financial industry when he said free cash flow. And you talk about free cash flow in your video, the Perpetual Wealth Code, the one with tens and thousands of views. What exactly is free cash flow? Free cash flow is money that you get to use over and over again without paying taxes on it. And you can set it up and, and Bezos and other people that have been very successful use basically shareholders money to use over and over and over again and make their profit margins very low. And so they're not paying back the shareholders a lot, but they're expanding. And that's how Amazon.com has been able to expand so rapidly. If you read Jeff Bezos' shareholder notes, you'll find out that's exactly what he's doing. And that's what we're proposing people to do by uh, using the insurance company's money when they leverage their policy to use that money over and over again. Take Warren Buffett's example of only paying interest on loans when you need to. And then you get to use that money over and over again because of the the tax-free nature of the way that the, the policy set up. Oh, God. So just in a nutshell, what's the difference between plain cash flow and free cash flow? Well, cash flow is, is something that balances each other. You got a money in, you got money out. That's a cash flow. You're tracking it. You know, you've got expenses, you've got income, you've got taxes, you've got income. That's cash flow. You're monitoring cash flow. But free cash flow is when you have money coming in. You can pay your taxes, but you set it up so that money comes back to you. Now you've got a loop of free cash flow that you can use over and over and over again. You know, it used to be that people would buy a piece of equipment and start a sinking fund savings method because they knew the equipment was going to be replaced. And so we're just advocating continue that model of repayment so that money becomes free cash flow and set it up in a way so that you're actually forcing yourself to save more without feeling the discomfort of savings because savings is the most important thing uh, in the game. That's excellent. What you said is that cash flow is basically money moving, money in, money out. Free cash flow is extra money that you wouldn't have had if you didn't basically look for opportunity like Warren Buffett does. It's, and be smart with your money. It's free cash flow because it's freely coming back to you to use over again. Yes. Okay, excellent. We'll go into the third question here. Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos, they're definitely shrewd in business. And by shrewd, I do mean shrewd. 
Do you approve of all their business tactics? Well, of course not. But, you know, I'm reminded of a passage in Luke that Jesus tells us that the children of this age are more shrewd when it comes to money matters than the children of light. And it wasn't a compliment. Hmm. He was telling us we need to get our game on and we need to get up to the shrewdness of being able to be wise money managers. And if we're not, then we're going to be taken advantage of by the people in this world that are shrewd and that maybe are not even honest sometimes. And so we always want people to be honest. We want them to be ethical. We want them to work with morals because morals are what create our value. But at the same time, we need to get our game up because we need to just understand the basics of that money flows. And it's going to flow someplace. It's either going to flow away from us or we can be smart enough and shrewd enough, if we want to lose that word, to have it returned to us to use over again. So what you're saying is basically people need to become educated, which is what a lot of your yeah. videos are about, just educating people so they understand what's happening. It is. You know, we find out people are very, very smart. When we talk to people and explain the facts about how this works, nobody says, I don't get it, unless they are, are really just trying to, um, to be obstinate. And once they know what to do, 99% of them know the next step. It's not something that we have to tell someone to do. We are not money managers. We are helping people become their own money managers so that they can have the free cash flow and the ability to pay themselves interest without filling it. Absolutely. And you know who makes the money, right? Money managers. Yes. That's why we want you to be your own money manager. I want to go on to question four right now. You mentioned that people can save in a 401k. Sure they can. Okay. Is that something you advocate? Well, you know, the ramifications of a 401k is that uh, you pay taxes on the harvest later. That means all the contributions that your employer put in there, all the contributions that you put on there and the growth, because you've deferred that. Now, when is taxes going to be higher? Today or tomorrow? <laughs> Always tomorrow. Yeah, and some people say, well, I'm going to be in a lower tax rate, but our CPA who's been in an IRS auditor for 33 years, says unless you're going to live under a bridge, that's really not practical. It it's not. Happen. I talked to a gentleman in Texas the other day. He turned 70 and a half later this year. He has to take his RMD. Yeah. And he was saying, if I had to redo this, I'd listen to your dad and would skip the 401k completely because he's actually paying more in taxes than what he deferred, not only because his dollar is weaker and taxes are higher, but he's in a higher tax bracket after retiring than he was while he was working. And that happens frequently. Um, and even if you're not in a higher tax bracket, you end up paying more in taxes because you've lost your deductibles at that point. Yeah. Because uh -huh. uh, exactly. you, your home's usually your really close up. to be paid off or most of the interest is paid off. Your kids are out of the house and yada, yada, yada. And so I don't advocate for anybody to save anywhere except in a, in a participating whole life insurance policy. That's what I do. That's what I advocate other people do. I don't recommend people uh, to save in a 401k, an IRA, a Roth. That's not something that I'm even qualified to tell. But I just like to explain the consequences to them because, like I said earlier, when people understand the consequences that – you're paying, probably going to pay more taxes. You're going to have inflationary uh, taxes that are going to eat you up. And you're going to be paying on, on the, the growth of all of that for all those years. And so uh, when people see that, they usually make the right decision. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I like it. Something else, though, people that have money in a 401k or an IRA, sometimes they, want, they see what you're doing with a life insurance policy. They say, well, I can just borrow that money from my 401k or IRA. Is that as good? Well, they certainly can. And years ago, when we were still back in the IBC world, and we created an app for the iPhone called the IBC Game. You remember that? Absolutely. And we had a 401k, an IRA, a Roth, a, a conventional loan, and a, and a participating whole life insurance policy loan. Uh -huh. And we played the game of life of all the expenses that you have to do and the financing that you have to do. And guess what? It just so happened that participating life always comes out ahead. Part of the reason that is, is if you buy from a qualified plan like an IRA or 401k, um, you can only borrow it for specific reasons. And right. so now someone else is writing the rules of what you can use your money for. Second of all, there's a time frame that it, you're constricted with on how to pay that back. It's usually five years. And the interest rate is already set for you. You don't get to choose that. And the interest that you pay is going to come with after-tax dollars. Now, so you're paying back the loan with 
money you've already paid tax on. That's correct. Okay. Now, when you retire, the growth on that money plus the interest you paid is going to come back to you and you get to pay taxes on it again. Because you were adding taxed money to tax deferred money. Yes. And they don't differentiate that when they take it out so in that's, retirement? So that's double taxation. And yeah, so it it's, it's not as conducive for us to use a 401k or an IRA. And someone will say, well, what about a Roth? And we just had a client the other day say, well, I can borrow from my Roth to set up this little vacation home for my wife that she really wants. And I said, no, you can't. That's a violation of the Roth rules because you cannot benefit personally or anyone in your immediate family personally from an investment that a Roth is making. And so it's very, very limited. Besides that, a Roth, a 401k, an IRA doesn't have a death benefit. So it cuts out the legacy part of it. Or dividends. <laughs> or dividends. Okay. Right. So, yeah. you know, it, it's just kind of like, yeah, we can do it. We can do it with a lot of things. We can do it with a passbook savings account if we wanted to. But why? Why do we want to pay the interest to the bank when we can pay it to an insurance company that then shares that profit with us in the dividend? Yeah. It just makes sense. Absolutely. It totally makes yeah. sense. Okay. So on we go to question number five. And you say to stop spending your income. What yes. do you mean by that? Well, if we're going to put the perpetual wealth code into full motion, which we should, if mm-hmm. we want to create the most wealth that we can, then when we spend our income, we lose the interest on that. Right. Now, one of the examples I give is that if you have $50,000 saved and you're earning 2% on it then, and you decide that you're going to spend that because you have the money to make a purchase, If you're earning 2% on that, in the next 10 years, you give up over $11,500 of interest. So you're down $11,500 because you chose to use your money. Now, what happens if you don't use your money? What happens if you have to borrow it? Well, you can borrow money at 4%, make your purchase, and in 10 years, you'll be ahead because you'll only pay back $10,000 in interest, $10,400 and some dollars. So the difference there of what you saved, 11500 versus 10400 and something, you came out ahead over $1,000 just by doing that. Now, in the Perpetual Wealth Code, we're able to do both. We're able okay. to save, still earn the 2%, plus we're able to borrow, use someone else's money, the insurance company's money, right. pay the interest, and we're able to feed ourselves that interest by saving more money, making the payments comfortable and affordable over a period of time, and now we get... The growth of saving and the growth of the interest because we have become the money manager. Yes, absolutely. Don't forget dividends either. (laughs) Yes. Don't forget dividends either. (laughs) All right. Uh, That's good. Uh, Saving 10%. That's something you advocate in the 10-20-70 rule. That's sort of the foundation of the Perpetual Wealth Code where it has to start. Do you think uh, it's wise to save money anywhere besides participating in whole life insurance? Well, yeah, I, I we try to save money at the grocery store every time we go shopping. There's no sense in buying, uh, you know, uh, the name brand orange juice when the orange juice right next to it comes from the same factory, the same oranges, and it's twenty cents less. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that's just a no-brainer, so, right? So you sort of brought another <laughs> aspect of saving into there, uh, saving everywhere. What I'm specifically asking about, though, is saved money. Is it wise to stick it? anywhere else besides participating in whole life insurance. What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, I don't, I don't um, advise people where to save money. I just tell them what I do. Okay. And we've given up our savings accounts. They don't pay any interest in the interest they yeah. do pay, we pay taxes on. And so <laughs> we might as well put it in life yeah. insurance because now we've multiplied um, our legacy if something should happen to us. Because if I've got $10,000 that I put in a passport savings account, that's all you're going to get if I die, Ben. Mm-hmm. But if I put that $10,000 toward life insurance, it's going to multiply itself. You're going to get more and you're not going to pay taxes on it. And so if this makes sense to use participating whole life insurance as our savings vehicle, because the money's so accessible anyway. I mean, right. we can get it deposited overnight into our account in most instances. If not, it could be mailed to us within five days. You can float the difference if you need it on a credit card for five days and earn the points on the credit card. Yeah. You know, it's, uh-huh. it's just, you know, when we see the whole picture... It just makes logical sense that participating in whole life insurance is the best savings account we can have. And Warren Buffett says diversification is for people that don't know what they're doing. And we get the question a lot of times, well, should I have life insurance and should I have an IRA and should I have some gold and silver and should I bury some in my backyard? That type of thing, you know. And what I hear dad saying is he understands life insurance so well that he's comfortable 
not diversifying at all because he knows what he's doing. Now, at the same time, then, do we want people to have cash on hand? Oh, absolutely. Well, we do. Yeah. Because we don't know what's going to happen in the world and not being a conspiracy theorist or anything like that. But things happen. You yeah, need cash absolutely. on hand and we should mm -hmm. have cash on hand. But, you know, why put it in the bank and have to go to the bank if you need it on Sunday? It's yeah, not going to be there. And, exactly. You know, it's, it's, yeah. And a little bit of everything is... Right. We're very specific about what we do, and we have reasons, and we understand that. Okay. So one of the attendees in at the meeting you were speaking at in that video, the Professor Wealth Code, they wanted to know, what if your cash flow is fine the way it is? Why should you try and get some free cash flow on top of that? Well, going back to uh, Jeff Bezos, and if we look mm -hmm. um, at the Harvard Review, and look at the publication they did on Jeff Bezos. We see that Jeff Bezos' income is going up like this, okay? okay. And then it goes down, okay. okay, over the last 10 years. And up here is his profits, okay, and they're growing like this. And his, his cash flow is growing right along with it. And then all of a sudden his free cash flow drops way down and his profits shoot like this. What he just did is made a major investment with that free cash flow. And free cash flow is money that is going to be there to be able to take advantage of when a 2008 comes around and the market drops out. Now you can snatch up a bunch of real estate if you're a real estate investment. Or it can be any opportunity that comes along your way. If you don't have free cash flow and you've just got regular cash flow that's going and coming, you can't take, a, you can't take advantage of opportunities that knock on your door. You won't even see them most likely. But if you've got free cash flow there and the local uh, uh, corner lot comes available that's the most hottest piece of real estate in the neighborhood comes available at 50% off and you've got the free cash flow, bang, now you're the owner of that and you've created passive income. And passive income is really what the Perpetual Wealth Code is driving towards. And if we can get exactly. it going, then guess what? We've got our retirement made. That's made. exciting because... What a lot of people do is they're sort of behind the eight ball and everybody thinks, oh, consumer confidence is high right now. Everybody's feeling good and they're thinking they've got some extra capital on hand. They're going to go out and invest in real estate. And so they buy at a time when it's a seller's market. They uh, happily buy their real estate and then they get caught in the next crash. They, everything goes out from under them or they are just barely getting by on everything and they sell off to the people who... Have cash flow. It's just like the Trump bump. Everyone is so excited about right now because it's growing and people are buying like crazy. And guess what? Every bump has a decline, a Absolutely. decrescendo. Yeah. And so it's better to create free cash flow during the, the bump. And when the crash happens or the decrescendo takes place, now is the time to snap so in with right. your free cash Absolutely. flow and snap up those bargains. Absolutely. And consumer confidence is through the roof right now. goes so, back to what we were yeah. talking about being shrewd and wise. Yes. You know, why are we spending, you know, uh, it's like buying name brand stuff and, and, and trying to resell it at uh, bargain prices. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, okay. exactly. That's, <laughs> that's good. Okay, so you mentioned an internal rate of return of 4.35% or something like that. Is that true for all insurance policies? Is it stated in the contract? How do people know what rate of return they're earning? Well, recently, several insurance companies that we represent say that the compound annual growth rate or the long-term internal rate of return on their policies, participating whole life policies, you would have to earn somewhere around 7.31% every year consecutively with no decrescendos in the market, no uh -huh. collapses, no bubbles. And yeah. that would have to be there if you were going to match what the policy could earn. What's in a, in a... So basically the company is saying, and we're not saying this obviously, the company is saying 7.31%. That's what you would have to earn. Year. That's what you would have to okay. earn. And, and the policy is earning somewhere around 4.3, okay? Okay. To match that over a, you know... This is a long growth period. It's not like in year one. Oh yes, I I earn four point three two percent. It's it's the internal rate of return, and internal rate of return, a compound annual growth rate. That's what we're looking at there. Now, yes. what can we do with that cash flow? We can create much higher rates of return yeah. by using it wisely, either re um, uh, collecting the interest that we were losing to others or 
being able to afford to pay ourselves the interest that we would really like to earn. Uh-huh. And so we can get a much higher rate than 4.31% or 3.2 or 6 or 7. You know, typically we pay ourselves 18. Four of that goes to the policy or something like that. And the rest, 13 something's left for us. Okay. That's good. And this question I see mainly coming from people that are sort of new to life insurance. So they're trying to look at like a savings account. Like, did I earn 4%? Well, in a savings account, your 4% is taxable. So did you even earn that is the question. But we're looking over a long time period. We're looking at tax-free or tax-deferred. And the truth of the matter is you did earn it, but there's a cost of insurance. Right. Mortality. And it's the mortality cost and the the expense of operation of that block of business. So it is there. It's just not visible if you're just comparing, here's my premium dollar, here's my cash value. Because... Your cash value only represents the paid-up insurance that you've purchased. It right. doesn't. Oh, it doesn't um, uh, even. It doesn't reflect the cost of the the uh, one-year renewable, renewable base term. insurance yeah. that you're buying as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. So then you mentioned something about paying a premium from income. Never pay it from what we call your money manager account. Yes. That's uh, you know that's not a hard fast don't do this or you go to jail type thing, okay? Okay. But it's a mentality that you want to say, this is what I'm comfortable, this is what I can afford. Let's set up that premium payment so you never have to question that. Now, in the future, if you lose your job or you have a bad quarter or something happens that you have a lot of medical expenses or you have this huge opportunity that you can put your money into an investment that's going to make a whole lot of money. Money. Could you borrow from your money manager account or even from the dividends of the policy to pay your premium? Sure you can. Absolutely. But each time you do that, you have to be conscious and aware of can I afford to make the interest and premium payments in the future because you yes. don't want to make that a habit. Otherwise, you will destroy the goose that's laying the golden egg for you. Good. That makes sense. And now, an interest-only loan. You talk about never having to settle the policy loan, basically like an interest-only loan. You say only pay premium and interest. How does a loan ever get settled up is one question. And is there ever a time where somebody should think about paying back that loan? Well, Ben, you know that we have lots of policy loans out yes. against our policies, uh-huh. and we're paying interest. Some of them we're paying principal and interest right? because we like to have some liquid free cash flow in hand for those opportunities that not. Right. Okay. But the money that we have borrowed against our policy is generating more money than what it's costing us to pay the interest. Now, if I die and you don't get the money that we've already borrowed against my life policies. Are you going to be bent out of shape? Not at all. Because that money's already working for We're us. We're already using the money. Yeah. I mean, it's already It's here. already there. So it's uh-huh. kind of like getting to spend your death benefit before you die and getting to create value with it. That is so cool. And if I it can is. just pay interest on that and make sure that the money that I have borrowed is working harder and making more money than the interest, I don't really care if I pay that loan specifically back. However... Should we be the policy loan back? Of course. We want, yeah. we want free cash flow for opportunities right. in the future. And maybe, we want, maybe one of those opportunities is part of our retirement in the future. So if that's what we're looking at, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It depends what your end goal is, is what you're it saying. Does. And that really goes back to the mentality because if you're saving uh, cash for an investment of some kind, then you're going to want to pay your policy loan back. But it goes back to the people that are trying to pay their debt off and they want to get rid of mm. everything they own, pay all, off all their debt before they get a policy compound growth working for them. It makes no sense. They should get the compound growth working so they have something when their debt's paid off. Yeah. Robert Schuller, the Nobel Prize laureate and uh, economics professor at Yale, says that Americans save between 4 and 5% for 40 years and earn a 0% rate of return on it. That's because of taxes, fees, penalties, and inflation. And he says the only solution to this is to save more money. Yeah. And so that's what we're answering by using the Perpetual Wealth Code and participating in whole life insurance is allowing people to save 10%. But if they're not saving 10% already, it allows them to use that money so they don't fill it. Yeah. 
And then once they get on their feet and are saving that, they're going to be able to recover much more than 10%, because 10% isn't going to be enough to make you retire and live happily ever after either. We're no, not absolutely. advocating that at all. That's that's a myth, and it's been proven. You need to save about 30% if you really want to live happily ever after. Yeah. So, um, But this is a way to do it without filling that, because you take 30% out of your budget, that hurts. Yeah. It hurts anybody, regardless of your income. Uh-huh. Okay? And so this is a way to do it without feeling the pain of saving more, like Schiller says we have to do. Uh-huh. Because it allows us to keep using that money. It's not like a IRA, or 401k, or Roth where it's slammed away and we can't touch it again. Right. It's something that we have control and, over. And nobody wants to wait to live, so to speak, until after it's too late. Yeah, Rabbi Lappin says we need to retire right now. Fill a little Enjoy bit of retirement every, every day retirement because, every day. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we're just hoarding up for the day that we're going to... You know, kick our feet and sit back and sip coffee and sodas for the rest of our life. It isn't going to happen. Uh, we're <laughs> never going to have a story about that. <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> All yeah. right. Well, excellent. That's the list of questions I had today from uh, some of the Life Benefits videos on the YouTube channel. If you are subscribed, you may have watched the video already. If you're not subscribed, what are you thinking? You can go subscribe at Life Benefits YouTube channel. Just Google Life Benefits YouTube. It should pop right up. Thanks for answering the questions. I appreciate it. It's a fun, fun, fun. All right. Take care, guys.